Okay, welcome back. Uh, we will continue our study of uh, second Timothy chapter three. Uh, in the first few verses, Paul is basically talking about the prophecies uh, regarding the end times. Uh, he's telling Timothy that in the last days, you know, it will just be a very difficult, troublesome, uh, peerless um, times. Uh, things are going to get really bad. And uh, he goes on to describe the kind of people that would be there during the end times or the last days. And we know that, you know, uh, Paul wrote this uh, many, many, many years back. And, uh, you know, if you look at it, actually, you know, it's um, in, a, in a time and age where this is being played out before us globally. So uh, what uh, are the kind of people who would be there during the end times? He lists it out for us in um, verses 2 to verse 5. He says, men who would be lovers of themselves, just talking about men, also women here, uh, women and men who would be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, uh, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of uh, God. So basically we can see all of this kind of being played out before us globally and also in our own uh, city or in our own towns, the places that uh, uh, we come from, uh, you know, it's, it's it's sad to read some of the things that are happening, you know, in the newspaper. It's very sad and heartbreaking. You know, people are so brutal, uh, haughty, lovers of pleasure, you know, and um, without any self-control. They don't even know what they're doing, who they're doing, who they're hurting. It's very, very sad. But in verse 5, it's very interesting uh, to see that Paul even mentions, you know, religious people with the rest of the kind of people that he has mentioned who we will see in the last days. So very interesting that he's also talking about religious people here uh, with the rest of the kind of people. And he's saying that these people will, you know, will have a form of religion, which means they have a form of piety. Uh, they embrace a form of religion. Uh, people who embrace all the nice things about uh, their Christian faith but they will deny the power of God, okay? Now, we know the Greek word for power is dunamis, and dunamis is used in the New Testament basically to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, yes. Talks about the power of the Holy Spirit, about the uh, the manifesting or, 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 or God's power is basically of healing, deliverance, um, you know, miracles and salvation, all the work of the Holy Spirit. And so what Paul is basically saying here that is during the last days, you know, people will have a form of religion. Uh, they would, yes, be able to say all the right things, do the right things. Uh, they, you know, um, uh, they even claim to believe all that we believe in and they will do the right things, but they deny the power of the Holy spirit so paul is telling timothy you know from such people just stay away uh turn away do not be with them okay so um paul is basically telling us an important truth here that you know in the last days even as we are in the last days it's it's not just sufficient for us to have a form of Rigid, to know the truth, to know what is right, to do what is right. You know, uh, uh, it's uh, that's not important, but we need to have that, you know, with the power of the Holy uh, Spirit. We need to press in for the anointing, for the move of the Holy uh, Spirit. So if you have a form of religion, uh, but have nothing to do with the power of the Holy Spirit, then it's not going to be of any use because the time that we are living in now you know um, our teaching and our preaching has to be attested with science miracles uh, and deliverances that's how people are going to uh, you know know uh, what is right and what is wrong that's how they're going to know that 
you know, Jesus is the true and uh, living God. Because if you look at our world today, you know, religion is uh, picked up such great um, importance, especially in, uh, just even noticing in our own city, in our own land, some of uh, these festivals that other religions, uh, you know, celebrate was not done with, with such great, uh, uh, you know, they did not have such great significance or adherence or people just had one or two major festivals and that is it. But, you know, the time and age that we're living in, um, uh, religious, uh, religion and their philosophies have uh, become, has been so much hyped up that people are now, you know, thinking about God, thinking about the rituals, thinking about doing this, doing that and all of those things. So, you know, um, there's such a great more uh, importance given to uh, various uh, uh, religious, uh, uh, you know, various days. They celebrate the various gods and goddesses that they uh, celebrate on certain uh, days. So, you know, we are living in a time like this, and it's important that, you know, we pursue more of the power uh, of the Holy Spirit, uh, the more of the dunamis power of the Holy um, Spirit. So it's not just enough to embrace a form of religion which is void of the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's a time when we need to cry out to God and ask God, God, we more, want more of your power, you know, we want more of the manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit, we want more, more manifestations of the power of the Holy Spirit in operation, in demonstration, in and through our lives. Uh, why? Because of the time that we are living in, uh, you know, we desperately need the power of uh, God to work, uh, to be able to, you know, um, uh, uh, make a difference in the world for people to know who is the true and the living God and uh, for people to know for themselves that there is power in the name of Jesus. There's, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's healing in the name of Jesus. There is uh, uh, deliverance in the person of uh, Jesus uh, uh, Christ. So, you know, uh, we need to uh, uh, desperately cry out and ask uh, God for more of this, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit, more of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in operation, in demonstration, in and through our lives that we can make a difference in this world because you know people are uh, you know uh, are looking at uh, you know empty powerless form of religion uh, you know and they are into deep darkness um, and you know darkness covers the whole world and if we are going to deliver people out of that darkness yes we do need the dunamis power of the holy uh, spirit so uh, you know, it's time for us to all cry out to God and say, God, more of your power, more of your anointing, and also come to that place where we would want to be those vessels of honor and do those nests, take those steps that uh, uh, require us to be that vessels of honor so that God can pour out his anointing in a greater measure, in a greater way, in and through our um, lives. Okay. And um, he goes on to say about. Um, we we'll talk about sneaky men and gullible women in verses um, uh, 6 and verse 7. And he says, you know, for this sort. So, you know, he's talking about men who uh, who engage in, who he's sp spoken about in verses 1 to 5. Especially he's talking about this religious bunch who have a form of godliness but no power. And he's saying these kind of men who sneak into homes where they take captive weak and uh, you know naive or innocent women who are themselves loaded in a sin, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, and these kind who do not want to listen to the latest truth, um, but they like learning, but they don't want to come to the truth. Okay, they like information, you know, but they don't like the transformation. Uh, there are people who, uh, you know, who say or uh, tell you that you know they uh, they want to listen to the truth, but there are people who say, just tell me the truth. I don't want to change. 
Okay. Don't ask me to embrace the truth. Don't ask me to live the truth. Don't ask me. Uh, 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 don't ask God to change me or to transform my uh, life. So he's talking about such kind of men, you know, who would want to listen to the latest truth. They're interested in all kind of philosophies, but they don't want the truth to transform them. Uh, you know, they just want to uh, listen to the truth as information. But you know they don't want to embrace the truth and they don't want to uh, change. So saying such men will go to homes of such women and mess up their families and mess up their homes. And we know that there are such kind of men and such kind of women who willingly accept you and they come as yes, we listen. They listen to the truth, but you know they say that we are happy where we. Uh, you know, we're happy doing what we are doing. Uh, don't expect us to change. Don't expect us to be uh, transformed. Uh, we just want to engage and enjoy what we have been doing. And then he talks about this men of corrupt minds. And he talks about Janus and Jambres who resisted Moses. Okay. Um, so Paul is basically continuing to talk about these men, the same kind that he's been talking about in verses uh, 5 and 7 as well, in verses 1 to 5. And so Paul compares these men to Janus and Jambres, who, uh, who resisted Moses. And, uh, you know, um, uh, basically he's uh, referring to the um, episode or the episode or the, the narrative in Exodus chapter 7, verses 17 to uh, 13, when God uh, tells Moses to go to Pharaoh and uh, to speak to Pharaoh and to show the miracles uh, by casting, you know, their rod down and, uh, and becoming a serpent. And we know that when uh, Moses and um, Aaron obey God and they go before Pharaoh, you know, uh, they put their rod and... Uh, you know that the rod becomes a servant, serpent, but Pharaoh is not uh, alarmed by this. He just maybe laughingly, uh, mockingly laughs at them, and then he calls his wise men and sorcerers, uh, the magicians of Egypt, who also do the same thing, the same manner with their enchantments. Okay, um, uh, and uh, we know, but uh, you know, Aaron, but Aaron's rod swallowed up all the other. Uh, uh, rods and we know that Pharaoh's heart did grow hard and he did not heed to what uh, God was telling him through Moses and Aaron. So basically, uh, you know, these wise men are, uh, or these enchanters, the sorcerers in Pharaoh's palace were Janus and uh, Jambres. Now, um, in the Old Testament account that we read in Exodus chapter uh, 7, verse 17 to 10, 13, uh, these two names are not mentioned. So uh, the question that can arise in our minds is, how did Paul know? Okay, it was Janus and Jambres. So, be, uh, you know, maybe it was, uh, you know, he received, uh, we know that Paul was well taught in the Torah. He studied under great men. One of them is Gamaliel. And he would have uh, received this information from the ancient Jewish literature, uh, which is most likely the case. But also, you know, uh, he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would have, uh, uh, you know, uh, revealed this to the Apostle Paul. But uh, whatever is the reason, he writes these two names who are part of Pharaoh's group, where the spice men, the sorcerers, and the magicians. Okay, and we see that even though these uh, uh, men opposed um, and confronted Moses, um, you know, um, uh, with their enchantments, not with their theology, with not with their uh, doctrines or their discussions. But with their enchantments, their, uh, their, uh, their with the the magic that they, they did, you know, uh, which they were doing it through the evil forces, the unseen dark forces. Um, uh, so Paul is saying, in the last days, you know, they will be people who oppose the truth, just like these magicians uh, of um, of Pharaoh who opposed Moses. And um, basically, their inspiration is coming from the unseen 
forces of darkness in the heavenly realms coming from demonic forces from evil and you know this is a kind of uh, uh, opposition that the church would face which paul already uh, you know is mentioned in first timothy chapter uh, 4 okay um, and so he's saying in the last days this kind of opposition uh, will come against the church the people of god and uh, you know um uh but you know how did moses uh, uh or how did god work when you know he saw that you know the, hey these magicians were just doing the same uh, thing uh the supernatural work that he had asked moses to do do you think god was alarmed or did god say oh oh what do i do now you know or uh what is what does he change his plans does he change his plans does he tell moses to do something else or he changes his strategy he says okay moses let's forget these uh uh you know uh the supernatural works because it's not working let's go on to you know some other strategy let's try debating and arguing and discussing with them no we see that god does not change his plans the first three miracles that moses did by the power of god uh, that is you know changing uh, the uh, the rod becoming a snake water turning into uh, blood uh, frogs coming out of water even the magicians and the sorcerers in pharaoh's uh, court or palace were able to do the same thing but we see that god does not change his strategy he does not tell moses let's try something um, else but he you know god goes on with his uh, you know the supernatural work with more um, uh, uh, plagues that he pronounces and we see that you know um, the fourth plague that god sends uh, the the magicians were not able to do the same thing okay what did they say they say hey this is the finger of god that means it's the power of god exodus chapter 8 verses 18 to uh, 19. so uh what can we learn from this uh incident that happened in the old testament uh you know of moses encountering these magicians james and jabris and you know pharaoh uh, what lesson can we learn as a New Testament church um, uh, in the last days that we are living in. So something that we can learn is that, you know, if you and I are going to stand firm, if we are going to make a difference in this world in which we are living, then, you know, we need to stand against these kind of men who will rise up during these last days. And um, and hence we see that there is a need for more of the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, we need more of the power of the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. It's not time for us to turn back um, and go away or try to do something else or you know uh, engage in arguments and discussions and debates from the Word of God. Uh, yes, we need to speak the gospel, the truth from the gospel, but also we need, uh, you know, to press in uh, for more of the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, um, and tell God that we need more of the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the only way we can stand up against what is coming against the church in these last uh, days, okay? So, um, you know, uh, people can, you know, will do a lot of things through uh, occult, uh, through uh, the powers of darkness, uh, but, you know, they can go ahead and do what they want to do, but we uh, know that they are no match to the power of God because uh, they will they can progress to a certain limit but no further they will come to a uh, limit where they can exhaust all of their sorcery their uh, uh, their magic you know and they will hit the limit and when uh, you know which they can do with just the power of the demonic forces but uh, you know there will be a time when they will encounter the power of God and when they encounter the power of God when the power of God will be manifested uh, powerfully you know their foolishness will be exposed 
you know, and uh, because the power of God is much superior uh, to the power of the demonic uh, forces and they are no match for uh, our God who is omnipotent, who is all powerful. So Paul goes on to say, uh, you know, from such men, uh, you know, uh, be uh, keep away from them. So what are the kind of men? Men who resist the truth, men who oppose the truth, fight the truth, uh, men of corrupt minds, men who are evil, you know, with sick minds, uh, who are thwarted or twisted in their thinking, in their understanding, men who are uh, uh, disapproved concerning the faith. Uh, their faith is uh, not real, it's false, it's worthless, it's counterfeit. And he's saying such men will progress no further. They won't go too far with what they can do. And such men's foolishness will be uh, exposed. Okay. So there are two important things that we uh, uh, receive from here, from these verses, is that even as we are in the last days, we need to press in for more of the supernatural power of God, for more, cry out for more of the dunamis power of God, and uh, not go back, you know, when we don't, uh, uh, when we see others doing the same miracles, you know, coming against us, those people are coming against us doing the same miracles, but we don't move away. But we need to press in for more of God's uh, dunamis power, more of the, uh, uh, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit being demonstrated and manifested in and through our uh, lives. Okay. Um, and um, second thing is that we must stand firm in our faith, you know, demonstrating a greater measure of God's power until the foolishness, uh, foolishness of and the worthlessness of um, those who oppose the truth are exposed. Okay, so we keep pressing him, keep going on, you know, we keep asking God for more of his anointing, more of the dunamis, more of the power of the Holy Spirit, um, till we come to a place where uh, those who are trying to do the same signs, miracles, and wonders through uh, the power of the, uh, uh, to the evil power, you know, the uh, power of Satan, till their foolishness and uh, their worthlessness is exposed. We keep going on, okay? So, um, you know, we, as a church, we need to press in uh, for more of the manifestation of God's power so that his greater power and his greater glory will be manifested. And that is what ultimately happened in Egypt. Even somebody who is hard-hearted like Pharaoh bow down to the power of God and let the people go. Okay. Uh, any questions before we move on to verses 10 onwards? Okay. No, we'll move on. Verse 10 and 11, um, you know, where Paul is telling Timothy um, that you have, that he has to be careful in following uh, the doctrine, the manner of life, the purpose, the faith, long suffering, love, and perseverance. He's, he's saying in verse 10, but you have carefully followed, you know, my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. So uh, Paul is telling, but he's starting uh, this uh, verse, he's saying, but you, you know. Now, why is he saying, but you? Because Paul has just basically described the kind of people that will, you know, kind of threaten the earth in the last days, uh, with whom, you know, the church must engage with, with whom the, uh, with Timothy is, uh, you know, must contend with, with struggle and cope with in his own day. But he's saying here, yeah, but you, you know, he's just uh, basically show that Paul is drawing a clear dividing line between Timothy and those who ruled, uh, uh, you know, or those who rule or are going to rule the earth by 
demonic powers by the power of the evil one in the last uh, days. So he's telling Timothy that, Timothy, you had the privilege of working very closely with me. Uh, so, you know, Timothy had the privilege of working with Apostle Paul for close to 18 years. And we see that Paul, you know, uh, treated Timothy as a son in the faith. Uh, you know, uh, Paul let Timothy be closely associated with him so that he could see his the way of his living, the way of his uh, life, various aspects of his life, his uh, ministry, how he does it. And Timothy carefully has observed Paul. He has also had the opportunity to listen to Paul's teaching and the way of life and uh, to see the very purpose uh, why he lives his life, uh, the very purpose of his faith, his love for God, his love for the people of God, his perseverance and how he faced persecutions and hardships. Okay, So uh, why did Paul, you know, allow Timothy to observe his life so closely? Or why do you think Paul allowed people uh, and his co-workers observe his life and ministry so closely? Any idea? Why? All of you with me in class? Why did Paul allow his co-workers to, you know, observe his life and ministry so closely? Um, I'll just share my thoughts. Um, so I think the verse Paul says that he trained himself like an like an athlete so that uh, you can hear me. Yeah, in one of the verses Paul says that he trained himself like an like an athlete so that he will never be ashamed. So I think he wanted the people to learn from him. He wanted himself to be the representative of everything that he is teaching, and. Yeah, that's what I feel like maybe he was confident in, in he was not just there to preach, but he was practicing, training himself up in what he's preaching. And uh, so, yeah, basically not just taught the gospel, he lived the gospel. So he made them to observe his taxes. Thank you, Jafira. Anyone else? Because he wanted to train and teach them from his lifestyle. Yes. You know, at home, uh, uh, you know, who do we observe very closely? Children specifically, who do they observe very closely? Parents. Their parents, right? You know, and their parents are very open with their children, okay? Uh, but we don't see teachers being so open before their uh, uh, students. Uh, we don't see principals being so open before their uh, students. Um, we don't see our bosses being so uh, open and free with, uh, you know, their colleagues. But here we see that, you know, uh, Paul was not just, uh, you know, ministering along with people. He was basically raising up sons and daughters in the faith. He was not raising up servants or ministers uh, basically of the gospel, but he was raising up, he was treating them as sons and daughters. So when you, um, you know, treat people like sons and daughters, you will raise up sons and daughters. If you treat people as servants, you will raise up servants. You will raise up servants. So, you know, it's important that uh, to note here that, you know, he was raising up sons and daughters. So sons and daughters, he was very open before them. He allowed them to you know, uh, look at various aspects of his life in a more deeper, in a very uh, close um, way. Uh, and why was he, you know, uh, why is it important for us to raise up sons and daughters and not servants? You know, because uh, we studied this in the kingdom of God, you know, when we discipline servants, what will happen? When you discipline a servant, what will happen? What will happen if you discipline a servant?
It's an easy question. What will happen if you discipline a servant? Any answers? When you discipline a servant, they get angry and upset with you. They'll say they're not coming the next day, and they will go and work in another house, okay, in the same street or even the next door. But what will happen if you discipline sons and daughters? They'll be upset with you, but they will not leave home, right? Because that is their home, that is their house, they belong there. They come back, they might show their tantrums, they might be upset, but that they know that is their home, that that's where they they belong, and maybe hopefully they will be able to see right from wrong and you know obey. Okay. And we also see that servants work for a reward, but sons and daughters will not get a reward. But they work because they belong. It is their house. Okay. Servants receive a reward, but sons and daughters receive an inheritance. You know, they receive the whole property. They receive everything that belongs to their parents. Okay. So Paul was raising up not servants because he knew that the work of God had to continue, you know, after he. Uh, um dies he the work of god continues and even jesus was so mindful right in the very beginning jesus was mindful that he's not going to be living here for eternity he's going back to the father that he has to raise up people and that is why he chose to dwell when he had to dwell with him always everywhere that he went and all of the things that he was doing, even the parables which people could not understand, he explained it to his uh, disciples. And we see the disciples continuing the work after uh, Jesus left. And we see that Paul trained and raised up sons and daughters who were able to continue the good work just like he did, you know, um, after he uh, uh, died. So, you know, it's it's an important lesson that we all learn as people who are you know, older and growing older, that we need to, even as we look at our younger generation, youth and children, uh, we don't raise up servants, but we raise up children, we raise up sons and daughters, you know, who will continue and advance the work of the kingdom of God, even after we have uh, gone, okay? Um, and then he says in... Um, uh, was 12 that you know and all who desire to live a godly life in christ jesus will suffer persecution okay so here paul is saying nobody is exempt from persecution if you love the lord if you desire to live a godly life in christ jesus if you desire to build his kingdom if you desire to pursue his call then he's saying that you know you are not exempt from persecutions but then he says, but evil men imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and be uh, deceived. So Paul is reiterating the fact that you know, uh, what will happen in the last days, uh, and he uses the word imposters, which actually is uh, the, another word is wizards. Uh, wizards are basically, you know, who are wizards, right? People who uh, cast spells uh, and they are, uh, you know, uh, involved with the occult. Uh, men who are basically energized by demonic power. So they do various things to energize them with uh, themselves with demonic powers, whether it's uh, giving so many human, making human, so many human sacrifices, drinking uh, human blood or doing various things just to, uh, you know, uh, receive those, be energized by demonic powers and we will see an increase of uh, uh, people involved with the occult uh, with the supernatural magical powers and uh, practices of the demonic in the demonic world okay and um, these men will be deceived and will also deceive many so even as we live in a world that is you know having these kind of imposters men who are trying to energize themselves with demonic powers. And it is very true, you know, um, uh, how much more as people of God, we need to grow stronger and stronger in the truth, 
in holiness, in purity, and also how much more we need to cry out and desire uh, for uh, the greater dunamis uh, to work in and through our lives to be demonstrated in and through our um, uh, lives so that you know, uh, God's work and the furtherance of his kingdom can uh, move further and can overthrow the powers of darkness. Okay. I know some of the parts of the world that you all come from, there's so much of a cult, there's so much of um, uh, black magic and witchcraft and all of that is happening. So, you know, and it's sad to see that people in the church are basically uh, caught up with all of these things and uh, lost in these things, but so much more that, you know, we as ministers of God, uh, you know, students of the word of God, how much more we need to cry out and press in for the greater demonstration of the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit so that people can be um, pulled out from darkness into his marvelous light. Okay. Um, and then Paul goes on to tell Timothy to continue in what he has learned. Uh, we'll move on to verses 14 and 15. Uh, he says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and be assured of knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So Paul is telling Timothy, continue in the truth because you know from whom you have learned it. So he's saying you've learned it from, you know, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You've learned it to, uh, from me, myself, Paul. And also he mentions that he learned it from his grandmother and his own mother. And from where he's also learned it from the Holy uh, Scriptures. He, he, Timothy has been taught the Scriptures. Uh, remember, you know, Paul did a good uh, three years of ministry in Ephesus where he uh, had this uh, school in the Tyrus Hall and where he taught and mentored and, you know, trained all of these people like Titus, Timothy, uh, Tychicus and, you know, um, 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 Philemon and all of those people. So he's uh, saying, you know, remember from where you learned, you learned it from the Holy Scripture, which is the truth of God's word, which has been deposited in you. Okay. So uh, two important lessons that we can learn from here is that, you know, we have to be people, uh, you know, who can be trusted in what we say, uh, you know, speaking the truth of God, living the truth of God. You know, we have to be men and women of credibility. Uh, you know, when our message is credible, uh, uh, you know, our message is credible when we are living a life that is credible ourselves. Okay, so our message is credible because we are credible. And if people, uh, uh, you know, uh, what have to trust what we say, they have to trust the way that we are living. So they have to trust us uh, and then they can trust what we say. Okay, and also it's important. Another lesson that we learn here is that we need to establish uh, people in the holy scripture and that is what paul is telling timothy you know teach the word of god teach the truth of god's word establish people in the truth in god's word and also live such a uh, credible life such a holy life a righteous life so that no one can point a finger at you that's what he tells him in first uh, timothy you know um let no one look down on you because you are young, but set an example to the believers in life, in conduct, and in speech. He mentions that in First Timothy. Okay, so um, that is also something that we need to do. If people have to listen to us, trust what we are saying, then we have to be people who are living uh, lives that are, you know, honoring in God's sight and that is credible before God and man. Okay. And then he um, ends uh, with, uh, you know, talking about scripture. All scripture is, uh, you know, good for equipping for life and for ministry. Okay. Verses 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every 
good work. So Paul is basically pointing Timothy to the Holy Scripture. And in, in, in that time, they had the Old Testament Scripture. And, um, you know, now we have... Um, uh, the old and the new, so we are able to understand. We have the complete revelation that is given to us in Jesus Christ. And there is nothing more that God needs to reveal because Jesus Christ is the full, uh, perfect, sufficient revelation and that God has revealed everything through him. And, uh, you know, so he's uh, basically, we have the entirety of uh, scripture with us, you know, and whole of scripture has been authored by the inspiration and the revelation uh, of the holy by the holy uh, spirit so all scripture is inspired by god which means it's god breathed uh, and the 40 different authors who wrote it in different time spans some of them you know most of them never met each other you know but we see this unity throughout scripture it's because there was one author and that is the holy spirit who inspired the various um, authors who wrote it and uh, they were moved by the holy uh, spirit and they wrote it under the inspiration of the holy uh, spirit and that's what we read in second peter chapter 1 verses 20 and 21 okay second peter chapter 1 verses 20 and 21 says Knowing this, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, how did scripture come to us? How did scripture come to us? How did scripture come to us? Uh, Second Peter chapter one was twenty one. Twenty and twenty one. How does scripture come to us? It did not come by the will of man. It did not come by the sense that, hey, I want to write this. I feel uh, led to write this. Okay, but it was written by holy men, you know, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Yes, they, they wrote it in, um, uh, you know, uh, the, yes, they were human. They used human language they, in, in their cultural setting, in their day, day and time, but they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so... Um, Paul also mentions what this Holy Scripture uh, does for us. He says, you know, the Word of God is useful uh, uh, for doctrine, which means it's useful for teaching, for learning. It's uh, useful for reproof, means, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's good to, pr the Word of God produces proof, evidence, conviction, uh, it's useful for correction. It's, uh, you know, it uh, straightens up people. It reforms them and it transforms them. Uh, it rectifies their mistakes, their sin, uh, their lies that they're believing. It's useful for instruction, which means it's useful for educating people, training them, nurturing them, uh, correcting them. It's also useful to make people complete, making them perfect and also uh, equipping them, getting them ready and getting them well prepared uh, for the challenges, for the things, for the call of God in their uh, lives, okay? So, um, you know, even as um, we are believers, you know, we need to give ourselves to studying, meditating, uh, the scriptures, uh, using the right tools for interpretation, knowing what it is and using it, and living by the scripture, not just reading the scripture, not just... Uh, feeding on it, not just interpreting, interpreting it, but also uh, living by the Holy uh, Scriptures, okay? So we need to give ourselves to studying and to living by the Holy uh, Scripture and also give ourselves to teaching the truth in, of God's Word because, 
you know, we see how useful God's word is. It's useful for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, uh, to make a person complete, making them perfect, and equipping them for every good work. Okay, so that is um, uh, what scripture does for us and how useful it is. Okay, so that is uh, chapter three. Anyone has any questions? Any questions, any doubts? I hope all of you are in class listening. Not thinking about the first Timothy ass assessment. <laughs> OK, if there are no questions, we will end class. Um, thank you all for uh, joining class. We'll. Uh, Continue with chapter four, uh, which is um, the last chapter in Second Timothy, and then uh, we'll move on to uh, the book of Titus. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Have a blessed weekend, and see you uh, next Friday.